question, is it better to be a jack of all trades and master of none, or to go all in and be the absolute best at just one thing? What's going on guys, my name is Jake and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at one of the newest tools in Resolve, and that is the Halation LFX plugin. And after some experimenting with this tool, I have officially formed a temporary personal opinion, and that is that even though this tool doesn't necessarily master one thing in particular, it does a lot of things really well. And it also helps to simplify a formerly complex node tree that would be used to tackle several different effects whenever we're specifically trying to recreate some film emulations, but a lot of those can be handled just in one node with this new Halation OFX plugin. So does the versatility and functionality of this new plugin make up for the fact that I think some of these results can be better achieved by some third-party plugins and some manual labor using some basic Resolve tools? Let's go ahead, dive in and find out. And for a limited time only, starting November 10th through November 15th, there is a 30% discount on my masterclass. Now let's look at what's inside FCM. 267 plus curated on-demand lessons, 100 gigs worth of professionally shot practice footage, access to exclusive Facebook community, weekly coaching videos with tailor-made feedback, $1,000 cash prize for the FCM challenge winner, Click the link to sign up for the masterclass before the special offer ends. Now you guys know the drill. If you're enjoying the content here, please be sure to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any future uploads. Also, don't forget to check us out on Instagram. And with that, let's roll the intro. All right, so let's go ahead and dive right into this one, guys. So today we're looking at the Halation OFX tool that Resolve released in DaVinci Resolve 17.4. And we'll just start off by going ahead and playing through this main clip we're gonna be taking a look at today. Um, the main reason I chose this clip, one, it's just pretty interesting. We got a lot of depth here, uh, pretty decent lighting. And another thing is that we've got some serious contrast in terms of luminance with this harsh key light behind us or behind our subject rather, and uh, these these shadows here that we're finding in the helmet. So that's gonna give us a pretty ideal breeding ground uh, for some halation there, if this was actually shot on the film. You see there's not really any halation here with it being shot on digital, uh, the Blackmagic Ursa G2 to be specific, um, but we do actually notice uh, fringing, which is like the digital more ugly step cousin of halation. So um, go ahead and get this set up. I'm gonna go ahead and lay out a node tree that is gonna be pretty, pretty easy to follow along. And we're just gonna go ahead and make uh, four, we'll do five nodes right here. And bring these two down. And basically the way I'm gonna be organizing this, uh, because as, we, as we've mentioned in the last couple of videos, a pro colorist is gonna be proactive in building their node tree. They're gonna have a plan and attack it rather than just you know going, making changes. Uh, and then trying to fix whatever they've accidentally made a mistake with. So we're gonna be building this with a plan in mind. And we're gonna start off with an ACES transform, and then we're gonna to move to our Halation OFX tool. Then we're gonna have another ACES transform here, a CST, color space transform. And actually, just to make sure that you guys are following along, I'm gonna go ahead and label everything. That's gonna be our ACES in. Actually, let me even label that further. And then we're gonna have ACES out here. This is going to be our CST, and this is going to be our film LUT. So let's go ahead and add, actually that's already there. So that's our CSTs in place. And now we're going to go ahead and start dialing everything in. So as I mentioned, this uh, was shot on the Ursa G2. So we're going to set that to Blackmagic Design uh, 4.6K Film Gen 3. Our output transform, it's going to be ACES CCT. And then for ACES out, that input is going to be ACES CCT. We'll get to it eventually. It's down here at the bottom of the list now. It used to be at the top, which made perfect sense, and then they changed it, so that's awesome. Uh, Rec 709 is gonna be our output. And then for our CST here, uh, basically this, we're just leaving this as is. If this node wasn't even there, nothing's gonna happen. Um, but this is a converted image from our camera color space into our working color space and output color space of Rec 709. Um, but we're actually gonna be working in ACES, so that's technically gonna be our, our working color space for this video. Um, we're just building that ACES pipeline within our node tree here. So the reason for that is that it's gonna give us the, the greatest amount of room to work with. We're working in a very large color space, um, being that it's it's ACES, and that's just kind of a, a practice you wanna carry with you. You wanna work in a, a, the least restrictive color space you can whenever you're grading, um, and since all of our grading will be happening between this first ACES in and this ACES out, that's how we would want to build out this node tree. So you can just think of it as ACES in, we're opening up this huge pipeline, and then the ACES out, we're closing it down here. All the work, all the grading happens between those two. Now after the ACES out, I know it's already Rec 709, 
Uh, the reason I'm applying the CST and the film LUT afterwards is just because the film LUT is going to be clamping everything to Rec. 709 anyways. Um, so we're not really losing any information by taking a Rec. 709 image, converting it to Cineon film log, and then bringing it back to 709 with the uh, film LUT applied. So with that being said, in our CST, this is going to go input color space. You could leave it as use timeline, but I'm going to go ahead and set this to Rec. 709, gamma 2.4, because that is what our timeline is set to. Output color space is also going to be Rec. 709, but the output gamma is going to be Cineon film log, which is going to allow our film LUT here to receive the proper input so that the film LUT applies properly and it sends everything back to Rec. 709. And then our film LUT is going to be in our LUTs tab in the film looks Rec. 709 uh, Kodak 2383 D60. Uh, it's important that I address all of that because the order of operations here is very important, especially to get the halation effect uh, to work properly. And rather than just show you what I'm doing or you know, how to set up this tool, how to get the sliders dialed in properly, it's really important to understand why I'm making these decisions it, because it really just wouldn't do you any good if we just jumped right into this video with all of these nodes already laid out here. And then I just started working with the halation tool without explaining you know, why I have everything set up the way I do. Um, I think if you understand why, you're gonna be able to make much more meaningful experiments on your own uh, and probably get a lot better results. And it's doing you more of a service to understand the why behind all of this. So with that being said, sorry for the long-winded introduction here to our node tree, uh, but as I said, it's important. So we're gonna go ahead and bring that halation OFX in here finally, and we're gonna set our processing color space to ACES AP1. And now you see one that's so important. The halation tool is color space aware, um, as long as you tell it which color space you're working in. And that's very important because you want it to uh, respond properly. You want the threshold tool and you know, the dye layer reflections, those halation effects, you want them to look as realistic as possible. And that comes from proper color space transforms all the way through the entire image pipeline. So now we're going to hop in and go over every tool here uh, in this halation plugin, which I really think should be called the film emulation plugin because it does a lot more than just halation. Um, and actually, Ironically, halation is the only part I don't use of this tool, and I'll show you why in a little bit. Um, I'll show you a substitute for that as well. Now, jumping in, we're going to go pretty much top to bottom here in all the tools, but we're going to start at dial layer reflections, which is essentially the halation, and then we're going to go into isolation, and I'll show you how the threshold tool works. Uh, so first off, we have strength, gamma, saturation, and spread. Pretty simple. If we zoom in here, and I'll actually go ahead and do shift F just so we can see this a little bit larger. So if we go strength up, you're gonna see that effect here, the halation, this, this red border around these sharp edges, those contrasty edges, you're gonna see that get stronger and stronger. And then gamma, if we pull this down, it's kind of like the contrast that it's using to analyze uh, where that halation should be. And you'll see it's kind of pretty much non-existent here. And then if we turn it all the way up, it is way too strong. So ideally, I, I would either leave that as it is at 1.35 or pull it back a little bit if you'd like. And then we have saturation and that of course is just the the saturation of the halation that's being applied and i actually usually pull this back a little bit to be right around 0 0.6 0 0.7 i think that looks the best and it's not too overpowering and then we have spread and of course that's you know, how much spread is that halation going to have how much blooming is it going to have uh, and you can also fine tune that relative spread which is going to affect basically the color of that halation so right now if you're looking at it and it seems a little bit too yellow you can take that green and that blue and pull it back and it's going to make the red a little bit stronger of course you could also just take the red slider and bring it up but i actually don't want to increase the intensity of the halation which is why i'm going to be pulling back on some of these so we're just reducing that spread and making it more red by pulling back on the green and blue so that's fine uh, i'm actually gonna go ahead and reset that just so it all looks pretty stock and we're going to disable that fine tune and then we're going to go back to the isolation tab. And so here we have threshold and threshold, uh, as most of you will know, it's basically just a starting and stopping point of when the effect is starting to take place based on most often uh, based on luminance. And so in this case, we can view isolated regions and now we'll see it's basically just a, a luminance threshold. And if we increase it to be higher and higher, that threshold is getting higher. And so it's not really happening anywhere. If we uncheck view isolated regions and we turn off halation. See, nothing's really happening at all because the threshold is so high. But if we bring it back to where it's just below, right where that those brightest highlights are clipping at, so now we're starting to see that halation take place uh, even beyond some of the regions it probably should if we're being as realistic with this as we should be. Um, but we can actually dial that back up and then just kind of clamp it off right around 
yeah, right here looks okay. And that's pretty close to point two where it started. Um, so that's why I usually just leave that threshold as is. Uh, we're not gonna touch on normalization and film saturation level. You can pretty much just leave those as they are. Uh, no, no real need to change those. So then next up after dilator reflections, you have secondary glow. This is yet another tool that I really don't like to use too much. If you wanted to add a little bit of bloominess to your highlights, you can do that. Um, but I do recommend increasing the spread and then reducing the gamma so it's a little bit softer because it can just be really heavy handed um, just out the box without those those settings adjusted. So increasing that spread and reducing the gamma, uh, that's going to give you the most realistic blooming of those highlights. Uh, we'll leave this right around here for now, even if it's looking a little bit fake, um, just kind of showing off the tool and what it can do here. So next up is basic grain, and that is my favorite tool here. So we're going to go ahead and append that. It just lets you do everything in one node, one OFX tool, which is super handy. And I'll get to again, why that's so handy here in a second. Um, but for our strength, I'll usually just bring this back a little bit. I definitely want to bring the size down right around there. Actually come back even more on the strength. Let's go ahead and zoom in. And the softness, I don't even really want to change the softness. It looks pretty good as is. It's a pretty good looking grain uh, being that it's just resolves built in tool um, and it's going to run super smoothly. There's a lot of other you know external third party plugins, even the ones that I do recommend. Um, they can be pretty taxing on your system. So now we're getting some pretty serious halation here. It does look pretty good if we turn off the node overall. We're definitely getting a little bit more filmic look out of this. Um, so for saturation slider, that's obviously just affecting the saturation of the grain. Usually we associate grain to be pretty desaturated. Um, but if you actually examine a lot of film scans, uh, there's a little bit of saturation in the grain. So I usually take that up quite a bit, uh, right around 0.7 is usually a good place. And so now you're actually starting to see a little bit more uh, color patterns in that grain. It almost looks more like noise. Um, but if you're trying to do real film emulation, that you do see some saturation in that grain a lot of times. So uh, if you have some references of your own to pull up, you can use those references to help you dial in these sliders and just match the grain as closely as you can. But right there, that's, that's a good spot for me. I like where that's at. So lastly, we have the global adjustments uh, and then global blend. And for the global adjustments, uh, you can check this box here to view just the glow uh, that's being applied and you can reduce the highlights here. And this setting actually does uh, it does two things. One, it reduces some of that artifacting that I'm not a big fan of that's happening here over to the side of this, this sort of the gradient that's coming off of that super bright key light in the background. Um, but the second effect is that it also kind of kills some of the halation effect there. So it can kind of take away some of the sting of that, those artifacts happening off the, the key light, but it also reduces some of the, the other good parts of the effect such as the blooming and the halation there. So I'll just go ahead and leave that as is. And then aspect ratio. This I really like actually because it applies to everything, not just the grain. Um, what the aspect ratio does, if we take this, it's at one right now. So just a one to one aspect ratio. So if we take it to two, it's gonna look like it was shot uh, on anamorphics and then it was de-squeezed. So all the grain, all the elements that were found uh, in that you know, squeezed footage that was shot on anamorphics, as it's de-squeezed, you also see the effects be de-squeezed as well. Um, a lot of squeezing there. So the grain, you see it's, it's much more stretched and then the halation expands a lot more laterally. And then you can also take that the other direction and go down to 0.5. That's gonna compress everything, squeeze it all in. So if you're going for an anamorphic look and maybe you shot it on digital, but you want your, you know, your halation effects to match that stretched look of your anamorphic footage, uh, taking that aspect ratio here and sending it to two or whatever your compression ratio was uh, of that lens, then you can definitely use this tool to help match the effects here with the, the actual footage that you shot in camera. Um, but since this was not shot anamorphic, I'm gonna leave that right at one. And the last setting we have here is detail loss. And this one does come in handy a lot. Uh, this footage isn't too sharp as is, so we don't really need it very strongly. But you know, on a lot of more modern cameras, modern lenses, you're gonna see most cases that's gonna be super sharp. And if you're trying to do some film emulation, that might not be what you're looking for. You want to kill some of that sharpness and that those details. So we can just take this slider and increase it ever so slightly. I really don't go too high with this, but right around here looks pretty good. And so it's very subtle, but for reset that, you'll see we're just killing some of the details there. And uh, it, one other important thing to note is that it does not affect the sharpness of the grain or the halation or anything. None of the effects are being modified by that detail loss slider. It is strictly for just softening up the actual footage uh, as it comes into this node. So we'll go ahead and zoom to fit here. So we'll go shift F to get out of that cinema viewer there. And then lastly, of course, we have the global blend. We all pretty much know what that does. It's just reducing the effect this OFX tool has on the image 
uh, as a whole. So we can bring that back and split the difference and just leave it as is, which is what I'm gonna be doing here. So now I wanna talk about the placement of this halation node and why it comes after the ACES transform. Um, you know, why we're working in the ACES color space as opposed to you know, one of the camera color spaces here. And the answer is pretty simple. If I'm working on a real world project, I want to you know, minimize the amount of steps I have to take on each shot. And one of the thing I would do if this was a real world project, uh, just to help save myself some time, I would go ahead and convert this to a shared node. I'm gonna go ahead and unlock it and then rename it to Halation. Anytime I make a change on that node, which is a pretty big part of our look development here, um, it's gonna update anywhere this node is placed. And the reason it works so well is because our processing color space is ACES AP1. So now if we pasted this grade onto a different clip and say it was shot on you know, Ari Alexa, on our input transform, all we have to do is set this to Alexa. For one, it's gonna help us with shot matching, but then two, it's gonna help the rest of the grade apply properly as we had intended. Because generally speaking, it doesn't really matter at this point which camera the footage is coming from because we've taken the camera footage and converted it to ACES CCT. So then all the effects here are going to apply very similarly across a number of different cameras and settings and everything. Um, so overall, it's just gonna give us a much more unified experience and require fewer tweaks on our end uh, to make sure that everything matches up and looks as it should. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this input transform back to its proper settings there. Um, and then lastly, what I wanna show you guys is just some of the alternative options to the halation that's built into Resolve ZOFX. Um, and I'm gonna leave the grain and the secondary glow and everything as is. I'm just gonna take the dial layer reflections and bring that to zero. Um, there's a couple options. Obviously one you may have heard us talk about is Dehancer. I'm gonna go ahead and add a serial node here, bring in Dehancer. We're gonna set our source to ACES AP1. I'm gonna go ahead and disable that Kodak Vision 3 uh, film look, as well as the print profile, the color head and everything, and the film green as well. All we're looking to turn on here is the halation. So we're just gonna turn on halation. I'm gonna zoom in here where we know it's gonna be most impactful and and we can increase it by bringing up our local diffusion as well as our global diffusion. So the Dehancer halation does not look too bad. Uh, the only problem is if we hit play, we're kind of struggling to get full speed playback and that's just from adding halation and I, the machine I'm on really isn't a slow machine. So with that being said, let me go ahead and reset the Dehancer node and I'm gonna show you my favorite uh, way to add halation, one that I think is probably the most realistic and is by far the least taxing on your system. So this method is one that I mentioned in a previous film emulations tutorial, which you can check out here in the top right corner. Um, and what I've done is I've just gone ahead and saved it in my utilities tab and it's just going to be a click and drag. It's a compound node that I can just kind of grab that thumbnail from the power grades tab and then just drag it over onto whichever node I want it to be applied to. And the key right now I have it set to 0.65. It's pretty you know low output, but you see the changes it makes there. Uh, if we go into that node, I'm not gonna break down exactly what it does in this moment because uh, I've already done that in the past. And this tutorial is not necessarily about how to build your own halation. It's more just about that one tool uh, and then reviewing it here. So that's my thoughts on it. It's not a bad tool. Um, the only downside is that the halation, I'm not the biggest fan of the way it looks. And so even though it's the tool itself is called halation, uh, it's actually one of the, the few things that I don't use from the tool. I actually like to build my own halation, have a little bit more control. Uh, I know fully what's going on there. There's not a whole lot, lot of documentation about what's going on underneath uh, or behind the scenes on the halation OFX tool that they've introduced. Um, so again, I just prefer to have my own custom built halation here. So you see there's before and after, and just to me, it looks like a more realistic halation there. It's softer, uh, it's not very harsh, and it doesn't introduce any artifacts for sure on any of our lights there. And you still have the ability to dial that intensity back uh, or bring it all the way up. And you can make that halation very strong if you want to. Uh, but again, if you're interested in learning how to build that uh, compound node there, you can check out that prior video on film emulation. So that's going to do it for this one, guys. Let's go ahead and check out the final look with Resolve's new built-in halation OFX tool. All right, that's gonna wrap up another color grading basics tutorial here on the channel. This one focusing on the new Halation OFX plugin from Resolve. And again, guys, if you're enjoying the content, please be sure to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel for more awesome content. Be sure to smash that bell icon so you don't miss any future uploads. And with that, I will see you in the next one.